Greetings, and welcome again to another segment of Casa Cares. My name is James Washington. I'm one of the staff persons here at Richmond County Conference. This is an opportunity that we've come to the venue to bring our stakeholders and partners regarding resources for our prospective families. Before we get to our guest today, I want to share some housekeeping with you. As many of you may know, March 13th is right around the corner. That is our next scheduled Volunteer for Youth Conference. Those seats are still up. So for those of you who've been to that conference, feel free. We'd like to see you again. Network with, network with us. We'll have opportunities to meet with some outstanding speakers who will feed you also in a fabulous price. Next, I think our housekeeping covers our parking slack. For all our active volunteers, those volunteers who have a case, please make sure you have your 2015 parking slack. If you do not have one, make sure you contact your supervisor or myself, James Washington. The next subject would be the members for our volunteers against your security ID card. It is a sequential opportunity for volunteers to have that authentication that says you are a Richmond County Catholic volunteer. So again, for those of you who would like to have one, please feel free again to contact me, James Washington, for your security ID slack. Our next message is going to be probably a commentary. Please, volunteers, remember part of your responsibility you must visit your children monthly. In addition to visiting your children monthly, you must maintain that dialogue with your supervisor. We are here to assist you. So those of you who are having difficulties, whatever reasons why you cannot visit or discharge your duty, please, for the best to that child, contact your supervisor, let us know. Let us know, know what we can do to help you. My guest today is Daphne Super. Daphne is the director of the Gonzalez Garden Games Head Start Program. Daphne, first of all, thank you and welcome. Thank you for having me. Tell us about the Gleams Human Resource Commission. The Gleams Human Resource Commission, it's, um, it has five different programs. We have Re Weatherization, CSBG, The Magic Johnsons, South Carolina Works, and Gleams Head Start. I'm here to talk about the Gleams Head Start. I understand you have a very personal relationship with the Gleams Head Start program. Tell us about that. I sure do. I started, I'm, I'm very proud to say that Gleams, um, I started out with Gleams, my daughter, who is now 26. Um, she was three years old when she walked through the doors at Gleams. I was a parent, didn't work, had a high school diploma only, education. Um, she came into Gleams and Gleams worked so good. I, I started in as a volunteer. I volunteered my time. I then became a, a teacher assistant. I liked it so well. I went up and I got my CBA, um, and that, that made me become a teacher. I worked on a little bit harder, became the head teacher, and from that point on, then I became a center coordinator. And that leads me now that I'm a director now. I started out just having a high school diploma, and now I have my BA in, in early childhood. Um, I can truly say Gleams has been good because for my daughter and for me, it's a success story because my daughter now, who's 26, she has her own business. She has about six um, stylists that's working in her business, and it's really been good for her. Now, how did Gleams benefit her academically? Academically, she was, when she started the public school, she was ready. She, for whatever it was that, you know, to take on in public school, she was ready. She was above her class. She got that head start. How many of these daycares, oh, I'm sorry, how many of these Head Start programs are in the metro area? Well, we have 17 locations in 10 counties. Gleams is the acronym for Greenwood, Lawrence, Edgefield, Abbeville, McCormick, Newberry, Salute, and we added three more, Richland, Fairfield, and Lexington County. So we serve um, a little less than 2,000 children and families, and they offer Head Start and Early Head Start services. We begin offering services as early Head Start, as six as early as six weeks in our early Head Start program, not including the fact that we serve a certain number of pregnant mothers. Tell me, what is the goal of Gleams? But better yet, tell me, what distinguishes your program to the, from a daycare? Our family have, have family service workers, case workers that work with our family to make sure that the children's health needs are uh, met. Our caseworker takes our family, get our family, when the child first comes in, they have, um, we always make sure that they have an assessment tool. We use that assessment tool, which is called a dial four, 
the children are assessed. We use that assessment to see where their weaknesses or strengths are within. And then our caseworkers, when they come in, they will make sure that the children's dental, visions, um, health, I mean, health screening and their vision and all of that is up to par that the children are healthy. If for some reason that they're not, the, the, and they have to have follow-ups, our case management, they will make sure that the families follow through on all of the um, services that need to be followed through on. I understand your program has an income-based criteria. Explain to us what that means. Yes, when the children, uh, to apply, the children, that's one of our criteria to enter, to apply for Head Start. The family must meet our, our income guidelines, and they must, in order to come in, our main criteria is to meet the income guidelines and to um, bring the child's birth certificate, and um, they will come in, and that, those are the two things that we would use to meet our, our guidelines. What is the income level? What is the income level? Yeah. They're, they're below poverty line. Poverty line. Yes. Okay. So Daphne, tell me, what is the process for attending? What criteria do you use to enroll into your program? Well, uh, once again, as I mentioned before, we're poverty-based. Uh, we have to follow guidelines, the income guidelines. A family can come in with their previous tax return and the child's birth certificate. That will start the process to getting them in. Um, also, we have a waiting list. Um, if a child come in and we have met our capacity, we have a waiting list that we, we take applications all during the year just so you come in with the, with the documents that, that are needed, which are the previous year's tax return and the child's birth certificate. So once that child has successfully been through your waiting process, what is day-to-day -day life for a child back at that point? A day-to-day -day life would be, um, we would start off, like, as I said before, we would do a screening on each child. Each child will have an educational screening just to see, and that's called a dial four, to see what their weakness and strengths are. Um, we would use those, the dial four, that when a child comes in, we would be able to um, complete lesson plans to try to meet the, get the child to be where they need to be. If there's anything that's missing, um, they'll use the lesson plans. They'll individualize each child to see um, what they need versus what they don't need. We will get them to the point where we are, where they need to be. We also have a tool that's called the CORE, and that's the child observation, where we look at each child. We do anecdotal notes on each child. We have three periods, to, not three periods a year, to see the progress of each child. During this time, this is when we take the anecdotal notes. They're scored, and they'll they'll see if um, they're checked to see if each child is where they need to be. If they're not where they need to be, they'll have the opportunity the next period. Like I say, we have three periods um, for the children to make progress, to get them where they need to be to the third period. If they don't need it, then each time, then they'll know what they need to work on. I understand that the difference between your program and a regular daycare is that you have case managers. And these case managers work with the parents. What is that program all about? Yes, our case managers work with our parents on a daily, monthly, all the time they work with them. They make sure that they, the children are, all of their services are, are, are up to completed and all the follow-through services are completed. On a monthly ba basis, this, the caseworker meets with the parents. They have parent meetings, they have parent trainings. Um, we also have a parent assessment, whereas if it's something that they need to help sharpen their skills and anything, the caseworker is there for them. Um, we have three to five-year-olds, so at the same time, we, we get the parents and in, in, um, get them ready to make sure that the children are ready to transition to public school. So at the same time, they go through, they make sure, make sure that the dental, their vision, their hearing, um, their health, anything that involves that child to, to hinder them, that caseworker is there to help that parent in any way. Also, it may be a case where a child may not do good on hearing or, or seeing or if there may be a problem, then at that time we can do referrals to try to get the child whatever help is needed at, at an early age, and we can refer them. If we have speech within our our service our program, the speech service is there. If there's something that the child is the articulation or something is not there, we have them to help, and, and the caseworker makes sure that the parents are getting what they need, also the children. Now, in your family assessment, you recognize the deficiencies of that parent. How would you address that? 
the caseworker will work with that parent as much as possible, whatever that parent needs. If she needs training, if she needs, if she needs to take her somewhere to assist her, whatever needs the parents need, that's what the caseworker is there for. That's what makes our program different because that caseworker is always working with the family and the children. Are you ever in a situation where you work with families in crisis? Yes, we are. Because that was right for the issue. We have some that they may not be able to pay their electric bill or something. We have caseworkers that the, they will go out and um, get take them to the places that we know we partnership win with. And um, that's what they do. They go out and see what they can do to help our parents to be where they need to be. Another one of those distinctions, though. That's another distinction, yes. Okay. But let me ask this question. For a parent, are these programs mandatory and compulsory? No, they're not. They're not mandatory, but our caseworkers take on that. Uh, they're just obligated to do that. That's part of our program. Tell me, what is your current capacity, and what is your waiting list right now? Okay, our capacity is, is 56. We have a waiting list of 49. Um, and our waiting list consists of children who uh, we have a system, a, a point system that we go by. Our top priority uh, priorities are children with disabilities, homeless children, and four-year-olds. Um, and then the three-year-olds come after that. So if they come in and they have that, we have to have a criteria because our waiting list is so large. We have to have a criteria as to how we would bring these families in. I understand another aspect of your program is that the parents are involved in the decisions regarding their curriculum. Explain that to us. As we said before, this is another distinction between our program and others. Parents play a very vital role in this because they, they're the ones that make the decision. They're the governing body of our program. On a monthly basis, we have a parent meeting. But let me back up. Prior to when school starts in August, in September, we have a parent meeting whereas a president, vice president, secretary um, are elected a uh, health advisor. We have health advisor and education advisory meetings. We have two of those people that are selected to serve on that on that committee as well. But this, and we have a policy council rep. That's the person who, um, that's our governing body. On the, every month, we have policy council that they meet and they they discuss our budget, our education, whatever policies are there. Policies are there. They discuss those things, and they and then we have a policy council rep. Our policy council rep will attend that meeting and bring it back to us um, to everyone, all the parents. So the parents play a very vital role in making decisions. The parents are very interactively involved with your child's welfare. Yes, they are. They help. Um, they help with all the policies, or they they help the everything has to be approved by them prior to it happening. To it happening. Daphne, tell me, what is the life like for a day for a child who enters your program? The life for a child that enters. Um, all the children does not ride. They don't ride the buses, but we do have some that we have one bus. The children will come in. Um, I'd like to also add, prior to the children coming in, before they can enter Head Start or enter into the classroom, our teachers are required to do a home visit to see what the environment is like for the child and to get acquainted with the child at that time. Also during that time, the teachers take pictures and they'll bring the pictures back when the child enters the first day. They won't feel so uh, alone or anything. They'll know that this person does know a little bit about me. So they will post the child's pictures. Also, during the educational park services, uh, we're required to do two home visits, one before the child comes in and one during the month of March or April. They're also required to do parent-teacher conferences. They'll do one in October and one in February. So uh, the parents at that time will come to the center to see what kind of progress is made during uh, the whole year and, and to see if their child is with where they need to be, or if the parents have any questions, they can at that time um, ask questions about it. During our time of the uh, our daily schedule, the children come in off the bus. We feed them breakfast, lunch, and snack. In the mornings when they come off the bus, they come in, they prepare for breakfast, they wash their hands, they prepare for breakfast, they eat uh, breakfast. Um, and we have a schedule that we must follow. But during the morning, we, where children can come as early as 6.45, for those children, for those parents that have to be to work or school at seven o'clock, they bring a statement in saying they have to be there. We try to be uh, we be able to accommodate them, so they come in at that time. Um, we'll have early arrivals, so we have those children that are 
in the back doing something educational or using manipulatives and something to that um, to that course that they be able to keep them occupied in the back. So the children will arrive, the ones off the bus will arrive, they all will eat breakfast. From that time, from breakfast time, they will clean up from breakfast. Once they clean up from breakfast, they do a time called work time. And then first they'll do, they'll do, go into little areas, they go into little small group areas to get everybody kind of wind down, getting ready for the day. The children would do work time. Work time lasts for like 45 minutes. Uh, they would then go in and do um, recall time. Once they do the recall time, let me back up. They do planning. The planning starts, and that's where they go into the areas. And uh, our curriculum is high school, and we children learn through play. You may look at them and say, they're not doing anything but playing, but at the end of the year, you'll be able to see where they have, what they have learned. But they have, first they have planning time, which they'll plan to go into their centers. After that, that'll take like 10 minutes. They go into work time. That's like 45 minutes when they go into their areas. At the end of work time, they'll have recall time. Recall time is where they come back to a group and they sit down and, and talk about what they've done in their centers, what they made, um, or, or what did they do, who did they talk to. They have just a little discussion yeah. about that. From that time, then the children may do small group time. This is the instructional time between the teacher and the child where they can sit down and do, make things or be creative, whatever, and let the children make the choices that they plan to make, this choices time, that they want to. This time is one-on-one? -on -one? Well, sometimes it can be, and then sometimes it depends on. With Gonzalez Gardens, we have a lot of interns from Benedict College that help us out. And sometimes they can be one-on-one, -on -one, but yeah. and then if they're not, then they're in a group. We have we split them up ten for each teacher. We have two teachers in a classroom, wow. ten per twenty. So they will have a group, and they all will do um, perform their small group. Once they perform their small group, they will come back together again, maybe in another large group, and get ready for work time. Outside time, I'm sorry, outside time. Outside time is like fifty five minutes. They go outside. And they have to go outside, even when it's really, really cold. The only time they wouldn't go if it's raining. But if it's very cold outside, okay. if they just walk them out there and just let them breathe the fresh air, okay. bring them back in. And once they do the outside time, they'll come back in, they'll prepare for lunch. They'll eat lunch between 11.30 and 12 o'clock. They eat their lunch, and they will then, after they eat their lunch, they will sit in a large group. A story is being read to them, and once they do that, they will brush their teeth. We brush their teeth twice a, a day. Then they come in in the mornings and after eat after lunch. Okay. Once they eat, uh, brush their teeth. Then they will prepare to take their naps. They get on their cots, take their naps. They sleep for about an hour. Once they get up from their nap, then they'll go down. They'll get a snack. And when they get their snacks, they eat. They they get ready and they be ready for departure. And that should be about two thirty. Sounds a great full day. Yes, it is. Now, for the most part, since we go to between two years old and three years old, how are the social skills for the most part? Their social skills, now we serve, as I said before, three to five-year-olds. Okay. They're so, some children come in and their social skills are not good at all. So those are the children that we spend a little bit more time with. That's when we, um, that's the time when we find out doing our anecdotal notes and the, our assessment, what is needed and what is not needed, and during the time for lesson plans, that's when they will in, do the individualization on trying to get the child what it needs to be. Okay. Now, say, for example, you have a child that has some behavioral issues. How do you address those? Well, we do. We work with the parents. We'll talk with the parents, see if there's anything that's going on at home that we need to be aware of. And if there's not anything, we will do referrals. We will we'll do referrals with the mother's signature and everybody will, well, that will be the last resort. We do referrals and see if, if, if we can find out what the problem is. As director for Gonzalez Gardens, the Lean the Head Start program, how do you address the specific problem that may arise at your school? We will use, we, we use redirection in all cases at all times. The teachers try to do whatever they can in the classroom to try to see if they or evaluate themselves to see what the problem may be. If we can't seem to, to, to see what's going on, then we at that time we will meet with the parents to see if there's something going on in the parent in the in the home that we need to be aware of. Um, we will talk to the parents, have meetings with uh, disability liaison or mental health liaison. We have a mental health consultant that comes once a month 
we will talk with them about it and possibly ask and get permission for that child to be observed by the parent. Uh, I mean, by the mental health, get permission from the parent that the child be observed by the mental health consultant. Once she uh, does her evaluation, she may give us some strategies to use to see if we if that will help some of the strategies that she recommends. She will also give the parents some, because once she does her evaluation or observation, she meets with the parent to talk to the parents and let the parent know what she has observed. Um, during that time, if it continues on, then we will continue to work with the family to see what we can do. Um, there is no expulsion. The children have to always be with, we always have the children there, but we work with the families to try to, to, to meet their needs and the child's needs. Glenn, you've been very informative to us today. Again, I want to thank you all so much. Tell me, what is the goal for every child that enters into one of your team Head Start programs? Our goal for the children that enter into the program at the end of the year, we want them, that child that came in, did not have any social skill, that they be able to socialize with children and adults, be able to um, know what, what they need, what is expected of them to, and, and our, they have met all of the goals and requirements during our year in that we make progress through our core assessment using our tool and that child will be able to go through public school with no problem. Now what does that include for the parents? That that the parents who we want to make sure that we accommodate them or help them be to where they need to be, that they have grown as well like the child. When they come in if it was an area that they were in or having problems in that our caseworker was, was able to assist them in any manner, get any kind of skills or whatever they needed to get them to where they need to be. We want not only just the child to be successful in being, but the parents as well. Outstanding. As you may know, our children are all in foster care, or these are initiated in foster care. Has Gleam addressed the children what's happening academically our kids in foster care? Yes, they have. Foster children, care children are also a top priority. Uh, when it comes to po points in our system, they get point system and we treat them just like any other child, but whatever needs is needed there, whatever is needed for them, if we have to do referrals or whatever the case may be, we are there to assist them as well. Well, again, thank you for your time and for this opportunity. Well, folks, there you have it, another opportunity for Casa Care. We want to thank our guest, Daphne Suber, who was the director of the Gonzalez Gardens Gleam Head Start Program. As a reminder for housekeeping, our next train is coming up in April. Please, if you have any ideas for anyone who wants to give back to our children, please feel free to give me a call. Contact me at James Washington, 576-1590. Again, we want to thank our guests today, and until next time, have a good day.